Welcome to another episode of Over the Glass. I am your host, Jay. I'm co-host, Nessa. And we are here today with Curtis Gabriel. Um, Sharks fans will know him from the 2020-2021 season when he was rocking the teal, but we, he most recently played with the Rockford Icehogs. And of course, he's a friend of the LGBTQIA community, so welcome to the pod, Curtis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Thanks for reaching out for saying you wanted to come on. We got really excited. You know, we're, we're just oh, yeah. like... How could I not? After you guys said it was because of like my, we were in the pride tape. I think it was you, Nessa, that said that. And then getting introduced to Brock that way. I think that's just exactly what I'm trying to do. So I felt like uh, this was just a perfect opportunity for us to get together and talk. Yeah, actually, we our last um, interview we did was our friend Elena. I don't know if you would listen to that episode, but she also I found. Have. She I was have. actually at a... Brady's house here. on your last I, pod. I, I know, and I was just messenger this morning. She was over at Center Island, I didn't know, and now she's down in Niagara Falls. She took a beautiful picture of a rainbow coming over. Mm-hmm. It's just so funny mm-hmm. how every podcast I do, Elena's just following me around. <laughs> and all these things. So yeah, she she DM'd me like I she messaged me after I had seen um, that you were. Um, I think it was on your IG stories or something. You were showing that. Uh, you were on Brady's podcast and she was messaging me earlier that morning that, oh, I had just arrived at Brady's and I was thinking, oh, I wonder if she got to like, you know, um, hang out and take a look at the podcast. And then she sent me a message later on that evening and she's like, you'll never guess who was on Brady's show. And I'm like, yes, I I can. (laughs) So that's so strange. That's so funny. Small it's world. so cool. It's crazy how um, the ripples of social media, like it's, you know, I think all of us who use it try not to get too absorbed in it, right? Um, mm-hmm. But it's crazy how far it can go. Like it literally mm-hmm. can go anywhere on this globe with an internet connection. Um, so to have people like Elena and fans from all over that message me or um, people in the community that message me, it's just like crazy how far it goes. And sometimes it's like hard to wrap your head around. It's kind of like how like the universe is so big, you can't imagine it. It's like, how far social media can reach is kind of hard to uh, imagine and comprehend. Yeah. Jay actually found out that we have some listeners in Japan, which is really crazy (laughs) to think about. (laughs) That's that's nuts. That's That's so fun. It's, I mean, we've, we've mentioned this a number of times um, that, I mean, in our first episode, we, we never really had this idea in mind to start a podcast. It just kind of happened where, you know, for whatever reason, me and Nessa were trying to find ways to create spaces within hockey. And, you know, being just fans, we felt that we didn't have a platform. We felt that we couldn't really, you know, engage from the inside. We just don't have those resources. And one thing led to another and we're like, well, why don't we just start a podcast and just start talking about hockey? Um, it in in addition, we're both, um, I mean, I'm, I'm Asian American, I'm Nessa, I don't want to sell Salvadorian American. So, and we don't see a whole lot of that. I mean, there's a, there's a number of folks that I follow that are like on the, like Canadian platforms, but majority of representation is cishet white folks in media and that doesn't represent us that doesn't represent what we we see in our interactions so that was just another aspect of it on top of us both being um within the community yeah that's beautiful like isn't aren't all the best things in life things that just happen like organically right like that's how i got Mm -hmm. involved in doing this work and why i'm talking to you to this day right now so it's, it's amazing how things can just unravel when you follow, I think, your true self and your true passions and uh, you're not worried about too much else. I think it's uh, crazy how the world can open up. Yeah, I know, like, when we started this podcast, we were just like, oh, let's just do this and work our way. Maybe we'll get some interviews here and there. And then, like, two days in, I think Brock found us and then you found us. And we're like, oh, this is moving a little quicker than we expected. And then, like, <laughs> Jay and I, oh, we got a new follower. Oh, we got some more followers. And we just kept getting excited after, like, people started discovering us. And we're it's like, cute. what do we awesome. do now? Uh <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, you put yourself out there and you never know what can happen. And like you said, like mm -hmm. we're all connected. So this, the hockey world is so small, but then you talk about the people trying to create space for LGBTQIA people. It's even crazy smaller, right? And we just want to see that grow. So as soon as you guys started, you had two people that, you know, we can connect you with Bain. We can connect you with all the people we work with in our non-for-profit that's moving on now, the Alphabet Sports Collective. There's going to be a whole, just you're never not going to have a guest on your podcast. Let's put it that way. How exciting. We're so excited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I did want to ask you, because we're both American, we, we've we talked about how we kind of came upon the sport. I, I just happened to come across it on TV one day, just flipping through channels, trying to figure out what to watch. And I saw the San Jose Sharks. And it was just like, yes, for whatever reason, I really like the sport and I want to get into it. And thankfully, I, you know, I spent majority of uh, my childhood growing up in the Bay Area and the Sharks just happened to show up like I'd say I think it was four to five years before that and I mean you're familiar with Sharks Ice that was not there before that is after years and years of the Sharks growing so it's much easier to get into hockey in this area now than when I got into it and then Nessa, Nessa's girlfriend just happened to be wanting to get into the sport and she, and so that was her kind of passage into it. So we're just kind of curious as someone who is Canadian, what is it like to grow up in Canada where it's pretty much like we joke, I mean, at least I joke that when people are born, they're handed their first bag of hockey gear because they're just, get on the ice, kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, I mean, I'm born 45 minutes north of Toronto in Newmarket. So it's at the front, when I was growing up, that was like the last stop on the highway before you kind of go down to like slower lanes. So it was like the last, the more, most suburb you could get of Toronto basically. And, uh, yeah, hockey, there's a rink every, what well, you guys would say every couple miles, uh, square miles and, uh, plenty of options, never shortage of ice. Um, I wouldn't say it was like, here's your first bag of hockey, maybe in a hockey family, but I really didn't come from a hockey family, which is interesting. Um, I come from a family that was much more into like the summer sports, uh, baseball, uh, basketball, uh, soccer, stuff like that. So my dad was really into baseball. That was his favorite sport. My mom was more basketball, volleyball, soccer. And they saw early on in me that I liked hockey the most. Um, for whatever reason, it just uh, was the most competitive. It was the most cool sport. Uh, I, I liken it to... You guys probably growing up and it's the San Francisco 49ers or nothing else, right? Football is king. Uh, Golden State Warriors are like right there or, or right equal to them. So it's just that level of cool for us up here. And it's like kind of mm -hmm. everything and the main focus of everyone. So that's that's what did it for me. And um, I didn't start playing until I was five. My mom actually put me into figure skating first. And I think that was very smart. And I think it shows like how my mind and her mind works analytically first. She's like, I think he needs to skate before he can go play. So I had to do like one or two badges of figure skating before I started uh, playing. Is five old by like standards? Yeah, it's about, I'd say it's like maybe the, maybe the start would be if you're like a, you know, Western Canadian family or a Northern Ontario family that has a pond and it's so cold up there all the time, they can start on a pond at like two, three, just throw them on the mm -hmm. ice. I think my first time was on a pond, but I was like five years old and then I got into playing. Uh, after that so I think that was like a little slightly late for like a hardcore hockey guy growing mm -hmm. up, I guess. five years old is late can you imagine <laughs> <laughs> I was playing everything else though too like I, I my dad was obsessed with baseball so I had one of those t things that you could step on it and shoot the ball up and I was already hitting that at like two mm -hmm. or three so he really tried to get me into baseball basketball I played them I just didn't like it as much so since you mentioned the other sports that you played um we we learned that you were pursuing a basketball scholarship prior to the invitation of the Owen Sound. Is that true? Do you have any it's kind of, to elaborate? Yeah, I know. It's funny how which article was that from? Did you do you that's, know on was from oh, that's on Wiki? Okay, yeah, so yeah. That's, that's somebody going in there and, and writing too much. Like that was that probably that came from an article probably from my good friend Kevin Pangos, who just played a little bit at the NBA last year, and now he's playing in Italy very good basketball player so he was like the big deal he's like the Zach Efron of the school like give him the ball he'll shoot it mm -hmm. he'll get the rebound give it back so he was the one that kind of said and his family said that I had the ability to maybe play at like Canadian University definitely not American University basketball I was <laughs> I'm like the same basketball player as I was a as I am a hockey player just do all the dirty work do all the stuff nobody wants to do bring the energy so 
I could have played if I wanted to just a little bit here and there, but wouldn't have had anywhere near the career uh, in basketball that I have tried to make in hockey. Sounds like you're you're being humble, but okay, I'll go with it. <laughs> That's what you gotta be. You gotta be humble. You gotta be humble, though. You gotta be humble. <laughs> I mean, well, compared to us, he is a, he is a professional athlete. So. <laughs> oh, I, I and if you're not talking about not being too humble, I remind my girlfriend all the time. She she she's turned it into this stupid joke where she calls me a paw, like a, oh, you said professional athlete so many times, I'm gonna turn it into a stupid PA thing. You're a paw. I'm like, it's like this stupid inside joke we have because she was a really good hockey player. And she's tired of hearing how, like, when she wants to go do something, I'm like, well, I'm a professional athlete, so I have to do this, this, and this. And she gets all mad about it. It's really funny. It's really funny. She's probably, like, hearing this out there laughing right now. Like, like, shoot me now. She sounds great. I think we would vibe together. That's the type of humor that I would have. She's watched The Office probably more than any other human of all time. And um, it's starting to rub off on me a little bit, but she definitely brings the sarcasm, the a uh, goofy kind of introverted weird personality and I'm the total opposite. That's me. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, so it's, I, it seems to get it seems to work well. Uh if you can kind of go over for us who aren't in hockey culture really. Where does hockey talk come from during interviews like you know the very oh, basic get pucks in deep. <laughs> we just got to play our full 60 minutes. Where does that kind of start to creep into your your like okay, well, lingo let me turn it around where do you think it's where do you think it comes from we hear it from interviews and we're just like what are you even saying <laughs> i would assume it's like the, the pr people i don't know yeah it's a good it's a good insight it's it's really just the insular nature of hockey too right like the only people that we learned hockey from were old hockey players and the whole idea mm-hmm. is right the team first not individuals we're just a unit you know wolf pack strength of the wolf is in the pack strength of the pack is in the wolf everybody's got to be on the same page um so those are those buzzwords that coach the coaches do say it and they do sometimes come in and say you know what i know you've heard this about twenty thousand times but it's the truth we've got to say it again because the cliches and the simple things are true it's not necessarily that we're wrong it's like saying those things allows you to just if you're in between periods, I'm a type of guy that likes to give more interesting interviews. It's just who I am. But sometimes I've gotten myself in trouble because that gives the other team bulletin board material. So I really had to watch that. Like in the OHL one time, we were playing really physical against Plymouth. And I think we won the game. It was a playoff game. And we kind of were joking around that, like, oh, these guys are that they're kind of soft. Like, we're going to beat them up kind of thing. And I said something like that. And they throw it right on the board or in the newspaper. And that's what you don't want. You, Hockey's a game of emotions. Whatever team's more emotionally engaged is probably going to win regardless of talent. Obviously, when you have a team like Colorado that's dialed in, that's hard to be. But it really comes from us not trying to get in trouble, trying to preach what the coach is saying, and try not to stand out too much. I guess. It yeah. makes sense, but... It makes sense. It it does, it does make interviews a little interesting where... We're just like I have no idea what you just said to me, but we'll don't even, yeah, don't even sure. have to tune in. It's kind of boring. Yeah. Don't even worry about the intermission interview. It doesn't matter. It doesn't really mean anything. But hopefully, when hockey the revenues continue to go up, uh, hopefully it can get to where basketball, where the players are so big, that's so true. important, right? That they can that's say whatever true. they want. They're still going to have a livelihood. They've made like twenty, thirty million dollars by then. They can be themselves. Like hockey's just not there. Uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, I have my opinions on it, but that's fine. This isn't about me. So <laughs> <laughs> we've heard this story from when you were on Teal for Change about how you met Brock McGillis. Um, for our audience who may not have listened to that episode, can you give us a recap about um, how you met Brock and how meeting him and other LGBTQIA folks has changed your approach not only in sport but in everyday interactions? Yeah, so I guess that starts with really this question too about the pride tape because that's really what led me to to Brock. So um, in 2018, I was dating uh, my ex-girlfriend and she had a friend uh, come out to be in a relationship with another uh, woman that they worked with, Ella Aritzia. And um, it was just hard to see someone who was such a sweetheart. She had never dated anyone before. She was just open to love. And she starts dating someone and her parents who are doctors don't financially support her, which was really surprising to me. So she had to move in right away. Just saw the stress that it caused and I just couldn't relate to that obviously in any way and it kind of blew my mind. So 
Fast forward, I was playing with the Devils in 2019, and we had a pride night. Put the pride tape on the shaft of my stick because I didn't want to put it on the blade. I was just trying to stay in the NHL. I scored my first goal a couple nights earlier. I was like so focused. Um, came in after warm up, and they said, "Hey, you can take the tape off. You don't have to leave it on." I looked at my stick, and it was as easy as uh, it takes me longer to cut it off than to just leave it on. And somebody's gonna hopefully notice. And then I went back to focusing and playing. It became a big thing. I scored a game-winning goal. It was like the best personal night of my life and obviously it helped a lot of people be seen and um, after the game you're getting all these messages and I'm kind of trying to download what's going on it was a lot and I see this message from Brock McGillis and I take a look at his profile and I said well like looks like this guy not only has lived this he works in this issue like he's a very educated man I've never talked to such a confident out gay man I've not been around that in my life so I was I'm a pretty confident guy usually but I was a little reserved let's say uh, when he, we first talked on the phone, and I think Brock kind of left that conversation with a little bit like, oh, like he just kind of, like that's cool he did it, but like it's not really going to do, it's not really going to go much further kind of thing. And I was definitely a little like taken back. It was also new. Um, so then I think a year passed, COVID had started. It was now like halfway through that COVID uh, first summer in 2020. And I think something happened where I think I reached out to him because I had a friend who was asking me a bunch of questions I didn't have the answers to. And I was like, let's do like a three-way call and get Brock on here and he can just let you know what's up. And then from that, it became, we just had more of a conversation. And I think he realized that I was a lot more comfortable and I was a lot more, you know, myself, extroverted Curtis, having fun. And he, we kind of just struck up a, a friendship from there. I kind of gotten a little more comfortable around the issue. So you basically started getting closer to him around the time you signed with the Sharks? Pretty much, yeah. That was probably maybe late, maybe that was in like about August at this time of year. And I signed, I think, in like November or something or October. Oh, interesting. I thought you guys were friends for longer than that. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, no. They're, I'm missing a year in there. Oh, my gosh. So, wait, no, no. Uh, oh, this house is really going back. So, I was playing in 2019. So, I played in New Jersey that season. Then I played in Lehigh. That was the year I didn't talk to him. So, yeah, that makes sense. I played a whole season without talking to him. And then, right before San Jose. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Can you elaborate between that year after you spoke with um, Brock, if there was anything you're kind of perhaps thinking about? Because um, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, I have friends that, you know, thankfully are very supportive of me and they try to grow and learn and um, not being in the community, they don't firsthand have that experience of what we go through and every now and then I'll mention something and they'll thank me for telling them about that because they haven't had to even consider something like that in, in their daily lives. So was there anything that you kind of felt like from after chatting with him as you maybe reflected on um, what that kind of, that small act could um, have on representation and speaking up for the community? Yeah, I think in that in that year, uh, it was a lot of following a lot of Instagram accounts, uh, immersing myself that way through social media. Obviously there was a lot of COVID. Um, I think it was starting to see this humanization of the, obviously I had a very small humanization that kind of realized, I was like, wow, that's strange. I never realized that somebody would be unloved for that. Like you hear of it, but it's different when it happens to someone in your life. So then just getting through social media, getting humanized, but really talking to him because this guy was asking questions on that call, like asking questions and Brock's answering them. And I think that led to me asking Brock about his story more and him sharing more about it. And I remember a bit before, like a couple months later, right around when I was signing with San Jose, I sat in on him doing his uh, speech to a, a group of uh, a hockey girls team out from out east in Canada. And I heard like his whole like presented speech for the first time of how, and he went into detail of how awful it was to be, you know, a closeted gay man in hockey that it's the game is just so talk so much toxic masculinity, hyper masculinity. It's that, you know, party culture, hookup culture, all those things. And he's talking about having to, you know, be with girls just to fit in. Um, he's talking about drinking himself to sleep in the OHL for many years and having seizing ending injuries because his body's all out of whack. He can't be drinking every night and trying to play high level hockey. He's on NHL draft lists. And then to have his career just tank because of that, because hearing guys in the locker room make homophobic jokes and say homophobic things just made him feel awful inside. And, and to hear that, you know, as someone who is just trying to 
play the game I love and do everything I can. And man, it's hard enough being a cisgendered, white, most privileged guy in the world. It's hard enough to do that. But to hear someone and the pain of going through that, but also the strength he had to say it now and not be bothered by saying it. Like he'd done the work and he was such a strong, secure person now. I was like, holy cow, like this is a lot to go through, but it gave me a lot of hope just seeing him go through such an awful time and be able to now talk about it to people on a whim. I thought that was incredibly powerful to me. Yeah, wow. I don't think I've actually heard his entire story, but I've heard bits and pieces of it and it, it same yeah it hits me every time <laughs> yeah it's uh yeah i remember like and my mom's like a like my partner in crime on this stuff like we kind of just we talk about it all the time we're so invested in different issues and learning together she's my only parent we have that special bond so i remember telling her and just she's really got invested in it too and it really shook her a lot too because she's seen what i go through just as the tough guy fighter doing everything i can to make it but he's that's just a whole other layer that we just don't consider. And I think that's why humanization and then humanization allows room for then the education to come afterwards because you have a vested interest in it. You see how much pain's there for someone and hurt and you want to help out. Yeah. I think it's, it's also, you know, because we grew up in the Bay Area and the Bay Area is like pretty accepting of being queer out here um and i feel like the only struggles i've ever dealt with was when i first came out to my family but you know now they're everyone's like super supportive but i'm not sure i've met anyone in person who has gone through something as serious as like feeling suicidal because they were queer of any, any kind you know majority of my family and friends were all pretty supportive i already had a bunch of like queer friends in my circle it just it it at it it was I came out at a time when I was supposed to but I spent some time living outside of California and that's where I kind of experienced some you know homophobia some like I, I lived out in Texas for a little bit and like the hairs in the back of my neck like I wasn't comfortable holding my girlfriend's hand for, for a while, just because I could, I could feel stares if it wasn't already that I stick out because I'm Asian American. I stick out because I don't conform to their ideal of who they believe I should be and should look like. And then on top of that being queer. And I mean, me and Nessa have talked in previous episodes and like offline, just if we see some representation, if we see a new film or video, it still brings me to tears because I I feel their pain. Even if I haven't um, gone through that experience, I have little bits and pieces to relate to it. And just to see somebody who hasn't had that um, support, hasn't has gone through all this pain, it's... And, for folks to just kind of brush that under the rug and try to make it our problem. Like, well, stop trying to like be different. Like it's, it's, it's more than people are seeing at, at just the surface. And as you mentioned, when we were asking you to kind of talk about your change of perspective from when you talked with Brock to where you are now, it's, it's that journey that folks aren't willing to take. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's mind-blowing. So you've both had different experiences, and I think what you touched on there, Jay, is like, I, it's, it's just being human. Like, it's just using empathy. You know, we can all relate our experiences together. We're all, we're all one. We're all part of the same race, you know? So for you explaining it that way, I haven't lived what you've lived, but I've lived going through the loss of a parent and seeing how hard that was for us and then how that bond was created strong with me and my mom. And then she's, we've seen together the, the trials of trying to make it through life as uh, the way you know we look and the way we identify and the way we just fit in normally to society and it's still so damn hard i think i've mentioned that already before like it's so hard just to be have a privileged life but then it's just the layers of intersectionality that are layered on top is just mind-blowing i think to us and that's where our empathy comes from and i think it's that self-awareness and um being able to look at that and Richie said people don't want to do that um which is strange uh, I understand that we all have lives and 
we all have careers and dreams and hopes and goals and like I said our own problems but we all should be helping out in some way shape or form like maybe it's not I tried to get into Black Lives Matter and stuff at the same time and I was like too much going back between the two like I feel like you gotta you find your one we're always educating all the other ones of course but you find your one that you try to make a difference on and I don't think there's any reason all of us can't have a side passion hobby giving back like that's literally what the highest level of existence is is giving back to others and that's where i the question you asked earlier nessa that i didn't really finish is how it's changed my life and it's changed it exponentially because i feel like i'm just so more so much more open-minded and open to like the suffering that's there but then in contrast the love that comes from it and how, what it does and it brings people together and it makes people heal and makes people stronger and that's what life's about is growing so it's changed my life and, and the way i see things a lot and it it's no surprise the way you all see the world because you see it through a lens of you've been treated differently and you understand what real compassion and love is and what real suffering is and you've come out the other side. So I feel like that's why I relate so much to you people because you're just the most compassionate people. Aww. Aww. <laughs> Seriously, no, it's true. <laughs> um, wow, yes. I like everything that you just said and it's, it's so, it's refreshing to hear from, from, a cis white man you know <laughs> it's i feel like there's just been so much negativity around queer people as of late specifically in the states with all these crazy laws and stuff and so it's it's just it's nice to hear some positivity right now um having said that <laughs> what are your hopes um ambitions with using your social media presence to raise awareness for for our community and the issues that we combat on a daily basis. Yeah, I think what you just said there is exactly like the mo main mo like my main focus is just existing. Like as the person I am and you say it doesn't come from people like me a lot, like that's the first thing I'm just proud to do. And I get messages about that just being visible. And I know visibility can only go so far, but I think it does just ripple out through social media, right? The amount of kids that message me and put pride tape on their stick now because I do, and they're just other straight young kids, you know, or maybe questioning or maybe, I don't know, I didn't ask what their sexuality was, so maybe they are, we don't know, but they're just out there, they're, they're sharing the same message, they're telling me they just feel like they can have a voice now because I'm out here doing it at my level and they can go tell it to their minor hockey kids, like that's, I won right there, right, but then it can go so much further than that, I think that's what the Alphabet Sports Collective is looking to do, and I'm really excited to be, I feel like that's kind of like the culmination of where I've started in this and now it's getting to like a real tangible organization. And I'm just like on the periphery, I'm just a part of it. I'm like the guy that has the connections into the hockey world. I'm like a gateway to like, you know, connections into the world and stuff, right? I, I, I'm learning, I kind of just sit on this, in the meetings, I'm kind of just sitting on the side, I kind of bring, I kind of bring energy. You know, I, if they tell me to do something, I'll do it. But um, I'm interested to get to keep getting involved in that and just be around those people that are learning so much and then seeing how other ways I can help. You know, I still got the stuff on my skates. I still got the project on my stick. Um, always looking for ways to help out and just find that balance of, you know, doing my life and my goals and helping out with this, this issue. So I know that there's a lot of exciting things coming from that. You know, we have ideas of having, I don't know if we've talked about this openly. I don't want to be like the microphone that says too much for our organization that hasn't fully formed yet, but we're taking in people. You now can tell us, Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have, we, we need more people now. Like we have like our group of, people that started, but we need more people to like fill out the committees um, so that you don't have like the same group of people on all the committees. So I think Brock put that out a couple weeks ago and people are applying. So that's exciting. But just like you said, creating space and community, I think we're going to have like Zoom calls because Chanel, who works for the Seattle Kraken, um, yeah. I can't remember her Instagram handle, but she just will have like Zoom calls with her friends and they drink wine and while they watch the game and just chat about whatever, you know, shoot the shit kind of thing about hockey or life. and. I think that's such a cool thing that we might create like Zoom calls where people just get together. Maybe one board member or one person involved sits in with like 10 people on a Zoom call. They watch a hockey game once in a while. They just build that safe space to watch a hockey game where nobody's going to be homophobic to you or bigoted or any of these things. They were all watching from a safe vantage point. And hopefully that just continues to build. And then we have a place where now we have an organization like Black Girl Hockey Club that can hold places accountable. And they have like this infrastructure to now like kind of put their hammer to things and, and keep people safe in the community and continue to build the safe space, just grow it. Yeah, I like what you said about um, how Chanel was um, looking to create a space where people just hang out and it's a safe space for folks that otherwise might feel like the sport is not uh, welcoming them into their space. And that's kind of 
what where what we talk about and one of the um we got a our first hate comment in like the first episode when we were just trying to share it on different platforms and someone commented um i think it was the clip where nessa was talking about why we even started over the glass and she was saying about how she wanted to create a safe space for you know queer folks to you know to be in the sport and this person said um well paraphrasing like why would you need to do that like hockey's already inclusive stop trying to ruin you know another thing and obviously this person is just you know thinking of themselves and not looking outward and doesn't even want to deal with anything else they just want to tune into their hockey game and not have to deal with anybody who might want to change what's going on on the ice or doesn't want to have to look at you know oh it's Asian American Heritage Month. Oh, I don't feel included in that because I'm not Asian American. It's like, that's not even about that. That doesn't mean you don't get to engage in it. It's just you're, you need to open up to the fact that this sport isn't inclusive to everybody. And that's just all what we're trying to do. So there's yeah, so many just, folks uh, who are still like that. And that's why we need these spaces. Yes, it's just a symptom of that's just a symptom of society where it's at really. And it's the best it's ever been technically, but uh, people are just so wrapped up in individualism and their narratives and their own trauma. You know, to me, I just genuinely see people who write stuff like that now. I genuinely just see them as a hurting person. Like that whole bullying adage, when you're somebody's bullying, it's because they're projecting their own insecurity and trauma and hate and stuff that's being done to them maybe by a parent or whatever it is in their life, they're projecting it on someone else. That's literally all I see that as now. If you put hate out on the internet, especially towards these kind of issues, you're just, you should just be looking in the mirror because uh, you have a lot of stuff to deal with. And um, that's what we all need to do. We all need to look in, inwards into ourselves first and, and figure ourselves out first. And then we can go to helping others. We can go to contributing to things, you know? So that person, I, I, I talk to these people all the time. Uh, a guy the other day was just sending me crazy, hateful, mean stuff like you're saying and you just kind of look at them or, or message them and just say like man like go back into your life and like focus on your family or do something like why are you hating me in the dms like it's just a symptom of something is wrong <laughs> yeah that, that's the most appropriate response to that it's through. just it's just <laughs> sigh like what do you even it's just like i think there was something you tweeted about a, a few days ago um someone else had shared um Right. Oh, UFC, and, the UFC one? Yeah, the UFC um, athlete. Yeah, was he talking about she how it's some... just like ridiculous? Oh, Fallon Fox. Yeah, the yeah. she had shared the hate comment yes. she got or something like that. Yes. Yes. And after I read that, I was just like, that's just, I feel sad for the person who wrote that. Like, what are you carrying in your day-to-day life that you feel the need to attack somebody else who's just being themselves like obviously there's something that you need to address in your life because you're feeling so terribly insecure that you are projecting it onto somebody else oh and it's uh you know as you get older i don't know about you but when i was younger i thought adults had it all figured out right i think that's where <laughs> a lot of I think that's where a lot of like abuse comes from, right? Because you're a kid and you think your elders and adults have things figured out and then they get treated poorly and it creates this cycle of trauma and abuse. But I thought everybody had it figured out. My mom did pretty much like a surface level to a child, you know? So I was like, my mom's awesome. Like everybody adults awesome. Everybody's got it figured out, right? And it's like, wow, what a burst of a bubble that has been <laughs> as I've aged into adulthood. Um, <laughs> I still feel like I'm like 17 on the inside. I can't believe I'm 29, but... I just think it's absolutely mind blowing how many people, especially in today's day and age with mental health stuff, are just hurting so much and don't know how to deal with it, don't know how to handle it, don't know how to talk about it. Um, and I think I was lucky in a way because losing my dad to suicide at a young age, it made me hyper aware of these things. And I was like, this is in my blood, this is in my brother's blood. I have to be hyper aware of these things so I don't turn out like that, you know? rest in peace my dad I'm sorry that he went through that stuff but at the time I was like I can't be that guy I can't be that guy but then he learned that he was hurting he wasn't it wasn't necessarily his fault he had a gambling addiction it's the way he was raised his trauma his way he saw the world it led him down a bad path so you know looking back at school 
Like, why are we taught about mental health? It's like crazy. We're just ta taught like the basics and you just get thrown into the workforce. It's like, we should be taught mental health. We should be taught social issues. We should be taught how to meditate. We should be taught how to self-regulate, not just like math, science, go play gym class. It's just like, <laughs> it's why people, everybody's messed up. Boy, as someone who has an anxiety disorder, I feel that. <laughs> My parents, that. yeah, my parents actually had to learn through me about mental health because I, I've been struggling with anxiety since I was eight, you know, it's, it's, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to get too deep into that, but I do I mean, wish that, <laughs> I do wish that people did pay more attention to it from a younger age so that we don't all turn out such anxious messes when we're older. <laughs> thousand percent agree with that <laughs> I can all right this oh yeah Go on to the next one. <laughs> i will we'll have to chat offline because that would that could be a whole oh. episode on separate <laughs> episode i'm not even joking like there's so much that i want to talk about but i am reserving it only because we're gonna get so off track <laughs> Like, yeah, I'm a podcast yeah. host. I gotta, I gotta focus. Podcast host, focus on right. Podcast. Yeah, <laughs> but we could definitely chat about that off offline. That'd be great. Um, so one other thing that we definitely wanted to hear your experience about is that you participated in the Seattle Pride Classic this past what spring, summer? What what time of the year are we at now? Like, I think it was like June. Yeah. It was amazing. I had never done something like that. Obviously, COVID had taken up those opportunities early on when I started this kind of work. And um, it also goes into just getting more, a little more like, ah, you know, I worked around my training. I used to be really too strict about that. I was like, let's just go out there and have some fun. I hadn't been on the ice yet. Like, uh, Stephen uh, Thompson and Joey Gale there were amazing and getting me out there and um, so accommodating. They weren't kidding when they run it like it's like a high end hockey tournament. Like I haven't seen hockey tournaments run like this and like straight hockey tournaments and stuff. So it was amazing um, to go out and just bounce around teams every day, uh, have fun with everybody, goof around, um, just be visible. Like I said before, as a you know cisgendered straight hockey professional player, just there, I think uh, mattered a lot to people, and I could feel that love. Like I could like feel it in the air. The energy was different, and I've been telling everybody about this. I even can relate it to going to the Rainbow Railroad event here earlier this, this summer in Toronto with Brock and friends. The energy at these events, because everyone's just being themselves and they don't care what anyone else thinks at the hockey tournament, at this gala. It's like people are wearing like almost nothing. People are wearing extravagant outfits. They're not, nobody's, nobody's, there's no hate. Nobody's making fun of each other. It's just inclusive, happy, love, and the best parties, the best times ever. Uh, and I'm uh, queer people know how stuff. to party. Oh my gosh. Like, <laughs> we know so how to party. More, it's so much more fun. It's so much more. It's such a good time because <laughs> everyone's just like, everyone there has been through so much and they've pro either come out or they're still going through it. And there's so much emotion and everybody's just helping each other. So that's how I felt at the hockey tournament and led into that event. It was just uh, the energy. That's the biggest thing I take away from it. The energy of just love. Love is the highest thing that was... It was just amazing. I, I love doing it. I was actually just talking about Pride um, at because I'm currently living in Vancouver, and oh, wow, nice. Pride Vancouver just happened last month, and I went through my experience. I went to a couple of events, and I was like, "This feels so nice." Like the atmosphere of just so much love and acceptance. Like I, I almost cried sitting there and just experiencing it. It was just so beautiful. Oh. I know, like all these people who hate on this or whatever their angle they're coming at us from, you know, they should just come to an event, you know, and it just, just it, if they couldn't even exist there, it just shows they're closed minded or decided minded. I've talked to people who are decided minded. It's like, oh God, it's like if they would just come and just let their walls down, which they have a hard time doing, they would have a blast and they would be like, what am I worried about with this community? Like what? Like they think we're trying to like take over, you're trying to take over the world. You're trying to like change society. It's just going to be all like big kumbaya thing. It's like, no, we're just a bunch of good people, been through a lot, loving each other, working through it together, having a good time. It's like, it's not rocket science, you know? Yeah. <sighs> if only everyone saw it that way. <laughs> I know. I know. 
But we are secretly trying to take over the world, though. <laughs> <laughs> just so we're clear, okay? <laughs> There's still the gay agenda. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> um, you'd hope you'd hope at some point here we could have queer people going to NHL hockey games in person, where it's just a fact that you can't bring that kind of hate into the building. You know. Uh, people are going to have their beliefs and all that stuff, but it should be just like a policy. Like you enter an NHL arena, you enter an NHL event, you know, just like in the, on the ice, if a player uses a homophobic slur and they're suspended and going to get reviewed and assessed, uh, you know, penalties and, and fines or whatever it is, I think that same should be, you know, extended to fans. I think that would be really cool. You know, we, we just need that safe space. That's what's the most important. Keep all that other stuff out, out of the game. People can be as hateful as they choose to be. We know they're all hurting. But in places around hockey, that's we need this safe space for people because there's so many kids coming up, so many kids coming up. I'm sure, like the, we heard so many stories. I've gotten countless DMs of people saying, "I just stopped playing hockey because of the way it was. Just, just didn't their happiness, their identity was of course way more important than the game of hockey. But we want people to enjoy this great game. We want people to not have to change who they are to play it. You know, that just sounds like the most skin crawling awful thing to me and I it sickens me that people go through that and like I have the opposite experience with when I got into hockey um, I mean as you mentioned kids that get into it and they know early on that they're queer and they don't feel that the sport is being inclusive to them versus getting the opportunity to be um, to play within the Bay Area and already kind of having that inclusive um, layer, I actually, um, hockey for me helped to feel more free in my gender identity because now people didn't see me, you know, as an AFAB person. They just saw me as another person on the ice. And uh, I mean, I've joked with Nessa that there's been few instances where someone will, I mean, I'm in a no checking league, but that tends to still happen. And someone will, I play with guys that are at least six feet tall. So, and you know, and they're a hundred pounds more than me when they knock into me, I obviously will fall over. And these guys will be like, Oh, are you K okay, bro? Are you right pal? And I'm like, yo, I'm fired. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it just really helped me to just be another person on the ice and not have um, I mean, throughout my whole childhood, I've been constantly being told, oh, that's not ladylike, don't do that, don't do this. And it just was the most confusing time that I'm like, I just want to live. Why are you constantly telling me don't do this, don't do that? It's very confusing versus getting the opportunity to go into a sport where someone's just like, oh, cool, you're here, you want to play with us? Awesome. That's all I care about. Oh, so. I can't imagine going through that, honestly. So I'm so sorry, but... Uh... Yeah, I just, we're social beings. We all want to be a part of the group. We all want to be, you know, known for what we bring positively to the group and not for anything else, you know? Um, and all those people that are hurting and can throw that shade and hate towards this community, they're just trying to fit in too, which is sad because that's their echo chamber, right? And I think that's that compassion that I've had to learn to have. Um, I'm not saying you guys have to, I haven't gone through what you've gone through, uh, but it's just like, that person is living in their group trying to fit in and that's what they're told is the right thing to do and to this community is bad and it's, you know, socialism, ah, you know, crap like that. It's just like, they're just, they're trying to fit into their group. So it's, that's why it's so important to have the visibility, to have the education behind it, the humanization, because we're going to slowly start changing. And those people that are in those groups and they're fitting in, the ground's just going to move under their feet. I did this uh, LGBTQIA panel with the 49ers last year. And, oh, I can't remember her name, Sam, that's going to bother me. She's the head of equity and diversity for the NFL, and she's a queer woman, and I think her first name is Sam. And she was just talking about, I think I went on a rant about dealing with those types of people, and she just basically said, like, hey, she was talking to, uh, I can't, people who study this, and she said, you know, there's 100% of the population, there's 10% who are, like, at the protests, at everything, you know, pounding on the door for change. There's 80% who are 
in between and are don't really care too much and can be influenced a bit. And then there's like the 10 to 20, whatever you want to call it, that are just so far against it. And we've got to focus on that 80 to 90 or whatever percent is, you know? And then with that, that's just going to move the ground under the feet of the people that are decided mind won't change. And they're just going to be pushed into small and smaller groups. And eventually it's just the bubble's going to pop, hopefully. And hate's never going to be totally dissolved in this world. There has to have that balance, but we can definitely make it a hell of a lot better than it is. Yeah, I guess I can see that. And logically, it makes sense. I think the problem with seeing it is that those that 10% that is completely against it is so loud. Exactly. And that's what makes it hard. Yes. And I think when I did talk about this, or I think of what is on that now that I'm remembering, I think Brock told me afterwards that like, that's a little bit of a way to not look at it for people who actually live it and not how loud that group is. So that's a little bit of more learning for me to remember. He said, it's not the best analogy, but I guess there's, you, you can take from me what you want from it, I guess. But I do agree with you. They're just so loud. And with the, all the legislation that's been happening and all the states, it's it's absolutely crazy to me that people are that uh, misguided, I guess, or just lost in the wrong beliefs. It's crazy to me. <sighs> yes. Okay. On a lighter note. <laughs> um <laughs> I saw you post on Instagram one day a few weeks ago about you had a story about Mike Ricci when oh, you were with the Sharks, gosh. and we oh, were curious you get to get the know. exclusive. <laughs> you will get that one for sure. I had a bunch of people message me like, "You better tell that on our podcast or something." So yeah, I'll tell it here for the first time. <laughs> oh man, that video they put out of him—that is, yeah. he's, you want to talk about an authentic person? That's Ricci. He can't be any other way. He can dial it down and be a little more heartfelt, I guess. But he, that's that's him, just yelling, but like having the most fun out of anybody on the ice. And he's not even playing. He's a coach now. He's having more fun than everybody. Um, so when I got to San Jose in a training camp and he was around, we immediately hit it off, right? Like he could tell that I was a little bit different. He's a little different, you know, <laughs> I think we got along. And uh, as it started to go along, he was the guy running the taxi squad skates. And... Uh, that had never happened in the NHL. So nobody really knew what to do. They don't know like how much to push us. Do, do we want to get skated hard? Do we need to stay in shape, but like it's also crappy to be on that. You're like in limbo between leagues. You don't get to play. So um, <laughs> after a while, uh, it just kind of was getting frustrating to me. I was on the taxi squad. You know, you don't want to be there. You want to be at least playing somewhere. And the skates were getting a little repetitive maybe for each and uh, we were doing things that I was just, I wasn't in shape. I didn't feel like if I got the call to play tomorrow, I'd be ready to play. <laughs> so sometimes he would like to explain drills without the use of a, a marker. And we'd have like eight guys in the ice and we're hockey players are visual. We need to see it most of the time, unless it's a very basic drill. So we were messing up drills. I think we were in St. Louis and in in a, in a before the team, or no, after the team skate. So the team skated, we're on like the worst ice. There's this much snow, you know, we're having to work through that, you know, that's annoying. And we're doing these drills and we're messing it up. The passes aren't good. Guys are kind of not trying a little bit. And Reach is getting fired up. He's getting mad. And I'm starting to get a little mad because I don't like that either. I like to practice hard and do things right. I like my craft. And um, I think something happened where he kept telling me little things to do and to fix. And I basically was like snapping a bit. And I was like, Reach, you didn't tell me to do that before. Like, you got to tell me. Like, if you. So it was just the, <laughs> the tensions were rising, let's just say. And um, it got to a point where. Something, I, I I don't know exactly what happened. Basically, me and him started just straight up yelling at each other. Just straight up yelling at each other. Like, F you, you know, giving it to each other. Like, this is a joke. He's like, well, then get on the line and skate then. Like, to do suicide. So just, you know, the typical punishment. And I said, perfect. Great. I get to do something hard now. That's going to get me ready to play. Let's go. So I sprinted over to the line. And then all my guys who are with me, they didn't seem to have too much problem with skate. They're like, are you serious? Like, we have to go skate lines because... Like Gaber got into a yelling match with the coach. Now we have to go skate lines. So I feel bad about that part. But to be honest, it was just not, it was just brutal at the time. So we needed something. So we start doing lines and like after every line, you know, instead of just skating and stopping being tired, I would go like hit the boards because I was just fired up and I was showing them like, you think this is punishment? You think this is punishment reach? I love this. Like, I love it. I will go all day until I drop dead. And I think that kind of made him realize and understand me a bit more. And then after that, we were like, best buddies and uh, every day in the locker room it was like a chirp fest between us but in like a lighthearted way 
he's calling me Psycho. That was my new nickname, Psychopath over there. Um, I remember one of the guys, it was his birthday that day, and he would always tell guys, yeah, Gabriel made me skate freaking suicides on my birthday. So anyway, I just, to me, that was one of the funniest things of interactions I've ever had as a coach. And it, it just shows the type of guy he is. Like he cares so much and he respected kind of that. And we just kind of got even closer. And now he'll text me when I change teams or get traded. He'll text me and send me a note. I miss that guy a lot. So seeing that video, my mom actually, when I posted it, my mom said, yeah, I've never met him, but this is exactly how you described him. And that bit, that reel of him yelling at everybody is exactly what she said. I'm like, I told you, I'm not lying. It's all true. <laughs> Such a good oh, one. I love that. That's <laughs> <laughs> that's the stuff like behind the scenes stuff that like as a I mean I'm a fan of the game too, but there's so much stuff that goes on like that. And that's why you go read those autobiographies by Gretzky or whoever it is after their careers because they share all that stuff. Like that's the, where the real like magic of hockey I think is is in all the little crazy things that go on. Uh, it adds so much context to like the game. So. Yeah, I, I can't wait to share more about that stuff when I'm done playing. There's so much stuff that's going on. It's absolutely nuts. Sounds no, fun. I love that. <laughs> so um, we we were talking a little bit on the last episode. Um, the Sharks had finalized their their new lineup of coaches and assistant coaches, and as I was going through trying to figure out. Where, where is everyone coming from? I noticed that you had played one season with Scott Gordon on the Lehigh Valley Phantoms. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you can tell us to look forward to with his type of coaching and what to expect with the Sharks? Yeah, I think he's running the power play from what I understand. So he's uh, he was a former goalie, uh, Boston mm -hmm. guy. So he comes from that Boston brotherhood of coaches. There's like David Quinn, him, there's John Hunt. There's all these coaches. so many Boston people. <laughs> yeah, and they all, they're all super tight. And I think they all just kind of move around together, right? So um, very detailed guy. Um, I, liked, I liked that about him. Ran, he ran the PK. And, and the, I actually thought he was going to run the penalty kill in San Jose because he has a very aggressive penalty kill style, which the Sharks have had over the past years. That's always, you know, in the top, the top of the league. So, But he's running the power play. He's a very... Very analytical guy, so I think it's a perfect fit for what he's bringing, and he's going to pair well with the other assistant coach they hired. I can't remember his name, but he was the Chicago Wolves head coach that just won the Calder Cup, and we play against him all the time. So Vanessa's favorite. There you go. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think that's a quite a quite a coaching staff they got there. They have Mike Greer's doing a good job putting, you know, David Quinn's kind of like the the motivator and the personable guy brings the heart to it. You know, he stopped playing the game at 20 years old because of hemophilia, so he really put his passion into hockey, to coaching, and then to have the kind of the new wave Ryan Warsawski and then Scott Gordon's kind of like his Boston buddy that brings more detail. So I think it's shaping up pretty good. And then you have Reach, of course, who's he's coming in the locker room every day and firing up Ferraro to get the boys all fired up and yelling at everybody. <laughs> so it's perfect. Sounds fun. We're big fans of Ferraro over here. Oh, don't even get me started. I could talk about him forever too, and I haven't talked to him in a little bit, so I feel like it's getting to a bromancy level or something. I'm not even that close. To him. <laughs> I really, I really wasn't. Like I was, I played not many games, so. But in a short period of time, I really enjoyed my time around him. He's as good as everyone says he is, and I would say he's better. People don't realize how good of a, a guy he is. Just a good human, good Canadian Italian family right there. Just good people. He seems fun. Yeah, he actually was one of the players that came out to, um, so the, for my work, since I work at a library, they, the Sharks Foundation had donated to renovate the children's room, and he was one of the players that came out. He did a little bit of like a story time with the kids, and one of my coworkers, because they're well aware that I'm a diehard Sharks fan, they told me, hey, you know that there's this thing going on downstairs, right? This and that. And I was like freaking out. And they like <laughs> told me because they told me who was coming. So I'm like, ah, ah, ah. And I went down there and I was like, stay calm, stay calm. <laughs> let let the children go first. Don't barrel <laughs> through the children. <laughs> and I just went up to Ferrara and I just said like, hey, I like your YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> He probably loved that too. He probably started laughing. He's, 
He's got a really infectious laugh. I don't know if he. <laughs> yeah. That wouldn't be surprising. Yeah, yeah, he does. Yeah. So he was probably reading to the kids and like messed up a word and just started like dying laughing at himself. <laughs> he's, just, he's so funny, dude. Oh man, there's so many memories of him. Like just uh, after games too, he'd just bring in COVID. He would just bring his boombox, like this huge JBL boombox that he would just have on his shoulder, and we had our like retro Run DMC tracksuits on and our bucket hats. So he's just like walking around i just followed him everywhere because he had the tunes and we were like dancing all over the place after a big win he's just like a fun person that's that's hilarious he does he seems like a really cool dude so genuine it's not often you see guys that are like that genuine and it's like not a show for example like he's just like that all the time like all the time unless it's like focused time and practice and then he's the kind of guy like me that wants reach to like make it intensive run somebody over he's hitting people he's getting after people so he's like he's got a switch he can flip for sure i think that's one of the reasons why we like him so much is because he's very genuine so we had um jay put up a thing for some of our followers to ask any questions that they want you to answer and so we're about to go through this first one says what was it like playing in san jose in the south bay compared to other cities you've played in and how would you how do you feel about this area as a hockey market? Yeah, that's a good question. I was always, I always thought like hockey is like, you know, old school. It's like cold area. It's like, that's the real hockey. But like going out there, I got a different experience with COVID going through. So I didn't go out as much as you would have. But um, I really liked it. My girlfriend really liked it, of course. Um, it was just such a different way to go to a game but once you got used to it i think david quinn i heard him talk about on the radio the center you can be able to get used to that you know boston rhode island guy he's like yeah i'm already pretty used to it after like two days so it's a beautiful place to play and it's like more like low-key like i've been to la and stuff it's such it's much more low-key it's almost like more spread out of a city like it's not so much of a big downtown i feel i don't know it's just very like has like a small big town vibe if that makes sense so as someone who regularly speaks up for the queer community, what's the most common myth about queerness and sports that you have to quote unquote debunk? Oh, uh, probably that it's a choice. Like, uh, you know, the, the, the religious kind of angle that people bring, the hate, hateful religious people, I know a lot of good, nice, awesome, accommodating religious people, but you know, the people that, that really think it's choice and that you are all choosing that th that way. And it's just like, I just, I've, lo I've lost like the whole need to just write it on a big rant. I just say it's literally free information if you just want to Google it. Like it's not, it's not something you need to like question. It's like the sky is blue. We know the sky is blue, right? You're, you're basically telling me the sky is red with what you're saying to me. Like that's how ridiculous you sound. You know, it's past like the globe is round or flat. It's like you think something that's objectively natural and real is not. And I just don't know what else to tell you. If you're not going to, you're going to say that to me, I'm just going to move on because you're just so delusionally illogical. It hurts. So that's probably the biggest one. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, um, it exhausts me when I see folks being like, well, explain this to me. Explain. It's like, uh, there's Google right there. <laughs> And all you the just, people that you just pretty don't much, want to. all the people we're connected with are usually saying it over the internet. So it's not like they can't say the only the only thing they could say is like, sorry, I'm a I grew up as a Mennonite. I live in the woods with nothing, no electricity, nothing. I had no I was raised totally against this. And now I'm here and I'm like, wow, there's skyscrapers and planes and buses. Like, I need to learn about all this stuff. That's the only acceptable way you think it's still not that to me. I don't get it. <laughs> Living in the woods. <laughs> like you're just totally, if you're totally cut off from society, sure. I can reason with you and now help you educate. And you need to be open-minded. But if you are a person using Instagram to tell me that it's a choice, wow. That is, it's kind of scary how many, that many people exist out there like that. It's terrifying to be honest with you. And you can kind of tell after like a, like one or two interactions with them, like, oh, you're, you're gone. You're not, you're just here to argue. You're not here to listen. So goodbye. Yeah. And I say, I say I have so much compassion for what you're going through. I would not want to live the life you're living because it's sad. I'm so sorry. It so, so, must be such a sad existence. I hope, I wish I could help, but good luck to you. So I say, and I think they're like, what? Like they just, they're like, they're such hateful people. They're like, he just was nice to me after what I said. And I hope that plants <laughs> like something. Kill them with kindness. Them. Exactly. That's, we, that's why love, you don't fight hate with hate. You fight with love. And that's how you waken people up. And eventually they're going to be like, 
Like I try to say to them, are you that, think you're that, you think that low of yourself that you're saying that to me? Like you're just telling me I am stupid. That's all I hear coming in your mouth. Like I don't read, I am closed minded, I am stupid. And I try not to say that anymore. I just say, I'm sorry that this is the way it is for you. <laughs> Love that passion, Curtis. Keep that going. Uh, that's what I do. <laughs> that's my thing. That's my thing. You don't mess with my people, man. <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, favorite ride at Disneyland if you're a fan. If you're I a have fan. never been. Never been. <gasps> okay. Need to go. I grew up. I grew up like 20 minutes from Wonderland. He grew so up in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> of Canada? No, we we have Wonderland down the street. I went. I, I went to Wonderland all the time. Ask for her about that. It's pretty pretty legit theme park. But I've never been to Disney. Maybe that's somewhere I need to go now. Um. Yeah, I guess if you've never been, I've been so many times. I usually go for the food now. <laughs> that's ex yeah, right. Like that's why I go to Wonderland. But actually, we're gonna go to C and E today. I think the exhibition place down here in Toronto. I haven't been on a ride in so long. I'm pumped. Okay. How about? Oh, this one's not a question. Someone just wanted to say thank you for all that you do for our community. Just wanted to squeeze that in there for you. That makes my day. <laughs> And then the next thing we have planned is a would you rather kind of rapid fire questions. So Jake can start it off. <laughs> would you rather have luscious long locks, but no facial hair or a Bernsey jumbo beard, but no hair on your head? Oh, wow. That's a good question. I've never heard that one before. Wow. I have, to, I think I'd have to, man, beard. I've always wanted a beard. I've always been that bad, but. <laughs> I think I'd stick with the long hair in the in the shaved face. I think that's how I'm gonna go with. <laughs> I think it would. And then you and Richie can twinsie. Yes, I mean, but then Richie would, would, would relate to me more than he does with the Wookie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, would you rather spend a week in the forest or a night in a real haunted house? I'm definitely going haunted house. Really? Ooh, spooky. Yes, I used to be scared of that stuff, but man, it's just. Nah, I, we'll, we'll just be friends with them. We'll become friends with them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, would you rather talk like Yoda or breathe like Darth Vader? <laughs> Definitely talk like Yoda, for sure. <laughs> Imagine breathing like Vader while you're doing, like you're being backskated. <laughs> I'm trying to backskate with Reach and I can't even yell at him properly? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be funny to look at him, though, with the Yoda voice and be like, you think you can beat me or something like that? You, know? like, you think you can crush my soul? No, no, no. <laughs> beat me, you will. <laughs> yeah, he says everything opposite. Yeah, right <laughs> okay, would you rather be a mascot for a day or drive a Zamboni? I think I know the answer to this one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> actually, my brother was a mascot for a basketball team one year, and he had, looked like he had the best day of his life. I don't know if I can dance like that though, so I had a, I had a momentary lapse, but say a bony driver for sure. Really? I think I'd want to be a mascot. It seems fun. Would you rather have really cool uniforms with a rundown stadium or a state of the art stadium with ugly uniforms? State of the art stadium with ugly uniforms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Take care of the body better. Yeah. Gotta have a nice clean sheet of ice. Yeah. Um, would you rather have your child grow up to be the greatest curler to ever broom the ice or the goofiest wrestler in the WWE? <laughs> so wow. random. Wow, that is, these are so random. I haven't heard them though, they're good. Usually they're always like kind of similar. Wow, I didn't grow up around curling at all or wrestling, but the wrestling sounds more exciting and fun and goofy, so I can go with that one. It does. Okay, that's all the questions we have. <laughs> those are pretty. Those are pretty. I'm pretty impressed. This is pretty <laughs> crazy questions. Made me think a little bit. The wonderful world of Google. Though I will take credit for the first first question, but everything else I was that like, was good. <laughs> questions. That was good. Someone I've tell never heard me. that one before. <laughs> Your beard one is a good one. Do you have any shout outs or anything that you wanted to chat about? Uh, we haven't sure. Talked to you already about. Well, I, I mentioned Rainbow Railroad, so I didn't know much about them before Brock invited me to go to that event with everybody. And uh, they literally take your donation. 
and literally take someone from Afghanistan who's hiding in a safe house before they get murdered and their whole family could get murdered. Um, and they just take them and they fly them out of there to safety and to be at that event and to see literal Afghani people step up there and talk about their experience with limited English. It was so powerful. And then the one guy met his partner while fleeing. Like, so his partner came from another place. They met at the same safe house, fell in love and came to Canada together. So like, I can't think of a better place for your money. The people there were amazing. So that, that definitely shout them out at Rainbow Railroad on Instagram. And then up here in Canada, out of Toronto, uh, there's a, 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 a non-for-profit called uh, Get Real Movement, at Get Real Movement. And they just literally go to schools and educate on LGBTQIA and Black Lives Matter. And I think other things as well, but those are like the main focuses. And they're just every year expanding how many schools they go to, talking to people, educating them on these issues. It's to me, you have the saving actual people's lives and then you have indirectly saving people's lives, educating kids in the next generation on language and how it's so important. Um, the intri intricacies is it that of it that maybe kids won't get if they're not being taught it. So I think those two are, are great shout outs in this space. If you want to find some community education or just some heartfelt emotions, like that's Rainbow Railroad stuff. It's incredible. Definitely got to check those out. Well, that's all we kind of had for you today, Curtis, but we're so thankful that we were able to get this um, rescheduled and we yep. had a lovely time talking to you today. And um, with that, that is our episode for today. I am your host, Jay. I'm Nessa. And we hope you enjoyed our chat with Curtis today and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks guys. Bye.